Hello, everyone. We are back, uh, getting ready here to go over Chapter 5, Network Security and Monitoring. Uh, let me just fix my screen here. So we're going to take a look at several topics in this chapter, starting off with some land security focused specifically at Layer 2. We're then going to look at a brief overview of simple network management protocol and then finish up with Cisco Switch Port Analyzer. So let's get at it. Uh, in the way of LAN security, the first thing we want to take a look at here, in reference to the OSI model, is typically uh, the, the focus of most of our security in terms of firewalls, IPSs, IDSs, uh, security appliances, are going to focus on layers three through seven. So we're going to be looking at, you know, information there. Uh, layer two, however, is a very important layer because typically if layer two can be compromised, then that would give an attacker access to several of the layers above two. So things that we're going to look at here are attacks uh, related to CDP, obviously Telnet, some switch MAC address flooding attack, uh, VLAN attacks, and DHCP attacks, all pertaining mainly to uh, layer two switching. So the first thing about CDP, Cisco Discovery Protocol, we know that's a proprietary layer two, and it is enabled by default on all Cisco devices. So very useful to have in terms of being able to get information for troubleshooting, configuration of directly connected Cisco devices, but also can be used uh, to gain information such as IP addresses, hardware platforms, uh, iOS versions, which then could be used to, you know, look at vulnerabilities associated with that information. So obviously we can turn that off uh, globally so with the no CDP run command, or probably a better solution is to turn it off on specific ports, uh, specifically ports going to end devices. Uh, don't forget that LLDP uh, is the open source version of CDP, which would have the same vulnerabilities. So that is one area of concern. Another area of concern would be Telnet. We know we really shouldn't be using Telnet at all um, because it's not encrypted. It's susceptible to brute force password attacks or denial of service with requesting multiple Telnet sessions. So the best solution here is just not to use it. You know, use Secure Shell. In the event, I guess you have no choice, um, which would be hard to believe in this day and age, then obviously strong passwords. And we would want to use ACLs to permit very specific access with Telnet. Uh, another consideration would be to, uh, when we're looking at AAA, to use TACAX or RADIUS authentication for that, uh, rather than local authentication per device. Uh, third area of concern, MAC address table flooding. So essentially, this would be where a threat would essentially generate a lot of MAC addresses very quickly to a switch, which could overload the MAC table. Um, and then what would happen when a switch becomes overloaded, it basically turns into a hub. So then it would start broadcasting frames uh, out every connected port, which then the threat actor could intercept and get information that they're after. So typically a MAC address table flood attack would be used to set up a man in the middle. So then they could gain access to what's flowing through the switch. Um, but there are, you know, several tools out there that can be used that could overload a switch very quickly. So the best solution for that would obviously be to implement port security, uh, lock down the number of MAC addresses that are permitted per port. So then once that limit is reached, you know, the port would essentially be taken out of out of service and the MAC flooding wouldn't be possible. 
VLAN attacks. There's a few different things here. Uh, number one, uh, setting up a trunk link on a dot one Q trunk link, uh, specifically if the switch port is left to DTP enabled mode. So remember DTP dynamic trunking protocol is Cisco's proprietary system that tries to automatically um, put a, a switch port into trunking when there's another switch connected or vice versa, put it in access mode if there's not. So if that's enabled, then obviously a threat actor could emulate this, what's required to request that that port go into trunking. Now, once the port is in trunk, keep in mind, uh, they would then have access to all VLANs, essentially, that go across that trunk. So this would be uh, very bad. So for this, we want to obviously disable DTP, and we want to uh, static our trunk ports, as well as staticking our access ports. Uh, in addition, we want to disable unused ports on the switch, static them to access, and then assign them to a VLAN that's not used. So put them in a VLAN, static them to access, and then essentially disable them. We also do not want to use VLAN 1 as the native VLAN. So we want to have a separate VLAN for that. We should also have a separate VLAN for our management VLAN. So we definitely do not want all this uh, defaulting to VLAN 1. And then also implementing port security on that. There's a couple other uh, attacks associated with VLAN, like VLAN hopping. Uh, there's a VLAN double tag attack. Uh, but in essence, these mitigation techniques would be good defense against all of those. DHCP. Uh, so there's two areas of concern here. Number one would be spoofing attack. So threat actor sets up a rogue DHCP server, assigning devices on the network to that to that server, which then again, uh, they could intercept traffic through that server. Another one would be a denial of service attack, a DHCP starvation attack, where essentially the threat actor would send endless requests. Uh, to the server, server here, and try to utilize or take up all the addresses that are available. So what we're gonna do on this is something, well, we're gonna do port security again, but specifically, let me back up. Uh, we're gonna implement what is called DHCP snooping, typically along with a feature called dynamic ARP inspection. And we'll look at that here. Uh, but essentially what it's going to involve is setting the server port access on the switches to trusted. And then the ports that go to all the clients would be considered what's called untrusted. So they wouldn't be able to uh, generate any DHCP offers to clients. Only the ones that are trusted could do that. And then there's another thing we can do on the client ports. We can set a rate limit as to how many uh, requests they could generate, which would mitigate a, uh, a starvation attack. So we'll see some slides on that in a minute. So if you look at the multiple uh, things we would implement, um, IP source guard is a feature we can implement that prevents MAC and IP address spoofing. Uh, as I mentioned, dynamic ARP inspection is going to basically create a table that's going to associate each device's MAC with its IP. Now we know the ARP table does that, but what this is going to do is it's going to allow the device to check traffic against that table later. So that would prevent spoofing of addresses. Uh, as I said, snooping, setting up those trusted ports and those rate limits, that's going to mitigate our DHCP concerns. Then port security, which would also handle our MAC address table uh, overloading. So just as always with security, we, we need to have several layers in place uh, to try to stop some of these attacks. So with our MAC address flooding table, 
Uh, as we said, if we set up our our uh, port security, especially to a limit of one MAC, then that would be the only MAC permitted on that port. So all the additional MACs that would be generated with the tool, you know, would cause the port to go into violation mode. Uh, VLAN attacks, as I said, we're going to disable DTP. We are going to static our trunk ports. We're going to uh, static our access ports, set DTP to no negotiate. This is done per interface. And then place all of our unused ports into a black hole VLAN, static them to access, and then disable. For our DHCP, here's a little diagram. Essentially, it shows that only the downstream ports from the server will be set as trusted. That's the green ones that you see here. And then the client side ports would all be set to untrusted. So what this is gonna do is prevent any client from acting as a rogue server because those ports will not allow any DHCP offers to go through. Uh, and then we're also going to set rate limits on these client side ports that would stop the number of DHCP requests they could send essentially to try and uh, starve the server of all available IPs. So that is a very good mitigation for DHCP. Uh, let's talk about AAA authentication. So we know our default is that we're authenticating locally to each device, but the better way to do it, and I know you can't see this because of my mug down here, uh, but there's a server here. Essentially, the difference being that now when we request access to the device, it's going to send that request to either a TACX Plus or a RADIUS server and authenticate with the database that's there. Uh, TACX Plus is considered to be more secure than RADIUS because all traffic is encrypted. Uh, with RADIUS, it's still secure but only the actual password is encrypted, not all of the traffic. This would be much better. We can also uh, have the server authenticate this against a uh, domain database, like against our domain controller. So we have unique logins uh, for each user attempting to access the device. Uh, and then on the device level of authentication, implementing IEEE 802.1X, which is a port-based authentication, uh, generally implemented in addition to something like EAP, uh, Extensible Authentication Protocol. So essentially, that's going to authenticate the device, which is called a supplicant, uh, through the switch per port, which is called the authenticator, against, again, the authentication uh, server here. So that would be device. Uh, the previous slide is talking more user authentication. Uh, simple network management protocol. There's a section here that kind of goes over that. I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with uh, either SNMP or uh, SPAN, setting up SPAN ports on a switch, I would definitely give this section a read in the chapter. Uh, there's much more detail there with more examples than we're going to get to in this uh, in these slides. But simple network management protocol essentially is used to monitor device statistics and or you can set parameters with that. Typically, it's used more to monitor devices. So you could monitor for each type of device, like a router, a switch, a server. Uh, there are certain parameters that are, we'll look at, at the tree here in a minute, that are typically monitored. But, you know, for example, things like interface status, uh, bandwidth utilization, those types of things could be collected from the devices, which are called agents, and they would be compiled into what's called a management information base, which is essentially a database that runs on your network management station, which in this diagram is called the SNMP manager. So this could be done through polling 
where each device is pulled periodically to gather those statistics. That would be using the SNMP GET. We can also set traps on each device, which would say, for example, when an interface goes down, immediately generate an update. That's called a trap. Or when a uh, interface reaches a certain percentage of utilization, generate a trap. And then lastly, we can send set messages, which could set configuration parameters on a device. Um, so that's essentially what Simple Network Management Protocol is used for. Um, some of the specifics. So I kind of uh, hit on this, that the agents, this is what we're collecting information from. That information is going to be stored in a management information database, which is on the management station. Um, and we can either get or set variables. So here are some of the specific uh, operations. And here is a diagram kind of showing, you know, sending a get request. We want a variable and then sending a get response, which would be, you know, the contents of that variable. A trap, keep in mind, is unsolicited generally for alarm conditions. There are several versions of SNMP in a modern network. Uh, nothing older than version 3 should be used uh, simply because of security. So you can see in 1 and 2, the authentication is through basically just a community string, which is unencrypted. So it would be very similar to Telnet. Uh, where in version 3, we can set up usernames, everything can be encrypted. So version 3 would be um, really the only option to use now. Uh, so here's an example. We have two types of community strings. So you can see here, uh, this would be representing the community string. And there are read-only and read-write strings. So read-only would be when we're pulling information from a device. And read write would obviously be when we're setting information in the device. But in those versions, the only thing that's checked is if this string matches. And again, it's unencrypted. So there's no users, there's no uh, passwords, there's no encryption. Now, the way this is structured is through what are called uh, object IDs. And object IDs are basically organized in the type of hierarchy or tree that you see here. Okay, so ISO, so each type of device is going to support certain parameters in the tree. And then they would typically be accessed by the numerical uh, parameters that you see here next to each one. So, for example, if you wanted to monitor, say, CPU utilization on a Cisco router, it would say 1.3.6.1.4.1.9.2, and then it would pull the variable that's currently associated with the CPU utilization. Now keep in mind, that's not gonna be necessarily in real time because that would typically be pulled. So it would be periodically checked. Uh, so things like traps would probably be a better way to, to monitor more in real time. Uh, and I should say before I leave that, that obviously this can be done with commands, uh, but typically your network management software is going to have a GUI-based tool uh, that you can use to do that. So again, I would say go into the chapter and look at that section because there's more, more, much more detailed information given there with some specific examples. Uh, SNMP v3, as I said, it's encrypted. So it, it provides message integrity and authentication. Uh, we're encrypting everything going between the agents and the network management station. And we have more control over uh, who can access what, because we're not just using a community name here. So some basic steps to configure SNMP. Uh, first would be to configure the community string and the access level. So we can see here uh, the community string is this. We're read only. 
Uh, secondly, and notice these are optional, so you can say the location of the device. So that would be in the second line. You can also say the contact. Uh, and then obviously we should always use an ACL to restrict SNMP access. So you can see right here, uh, simple permit to that network. Well, in this case, to the host. So we're permitting this host to access the uh, R1 in this case. Um, and then you can see SMP server host. This is the host, the version, and then the string name. So that's all that's really required. Again, check the chapter. There's a little more detail given on uh, the optional parameters and some specific examples, along with a couple of the uh, syntax checker activities that you can use to actually practice that. Uh, looking at the SNMP information, show SNMP, go to command here, um, and then also show SNMP community, which will show the community string and the ACL information. Best practices, uh, this can obviously create security vulnerabilities because we're opening up additional ports here for access to a device. Keep in mind they can also utilize uh, needed network bandwidth if we monitor too much information. We should not use version 1 or 2. Uh, if we have to use version 2, the string needs to be strong and periodically changed. We should always use ACLs to permit specific access. We should use version 3, and we should set up the authentication and encryption. So using the group name, uh, as well as creating users with passwords for that or pointing that to a AAA server. So for SNMP v3, we can see here we have an access list. Uh, we're going to set up a view, which is essentially uh, what we're going to view in the management information base or what we're going to pull from the device specifically, I should say. Uh, here's setting up the access with a group name the version, the privilege level read, and then pointing that, associating that with the ACL. And then lastly, creating a user, putting the user in a group. So those would be the four basic steps there. Um, and here's an example of that. So here's our access list, permitting in this case, uh, anything on the management network to access, setting up the view as read only, ISO means we're viewing everything in that tree, which would typically not be done. We would want to be more specific. Uh, setting up a group admin using SNMP version 3, privilege level read, uh, and then permitting read-only access. Uh, and then creating a user called Bob in the admin group. You can see the password in, in the last step here. Um, so that's just an example. Again, more details in the chapter. Swissco, Cisco Switch Port Analyzer, or what we call SPAN. Essentially, this is going to be set up for monitoring purposes. So keep in mind, when we run a sniffer like uh, Wireshark, we're only seeing what's to and from our port on the switch. If we want to mirror another port, then we have to set up what's called span. So typically, you know, we'd probably want to mirror the important interfaces like our uplinks, uh, server ports, things of that nature. So we would mirror that port and then probably send that to our network management system as well as an IPS or whatever security appliance that we're using as well. So that's really what this is about is port mirroring. Um, and again, the, the purpose is usually to analyze traffic or to look at security on, on the traffic. It can be done locally, which means the monitoring is on one switch, or we can monitor across switches, which would be called remote span. So this is an example of local, where the ingress and the outgress port that we're monitoring is all on the same switch. 
Um, some of the terminology, ingress traffic is obviously the port that the traffic is entering the switch. Egress is the outbound port. Uh, the source port, destination port can be interface or VLAN. And then each monitoring uh, pair requires a separate session number. So you can see here, this is the inbound we're monitoring, this is the outbound, and this is what we're sending everything to. Remote span, difference being we might be monitoring on S1, but we're going to send that traffic across one or more switches to reach our destination. Uh, configuring span is quite easy, especially the local version. So we do a session number, identify the source interface, the destination interface, and that's pretty much it. Verifying that, we can use the show monitor command. Let's see here. And troubleshooting with span, we can also troubleshoot because we can keep in mind we can have Wireshark running here and we can monitor you know, what's happening on a remote port and pick up on any details that might be going wrong there. So that's it for chapter five. Um, like I said, for this information, I would recommend that you actually go into the chapter. I did want to point out, you only have one assignment for this chapter, but it's a pretty important one. It's going to be the chapter five skills integration challenge. So this is going to be accessed, um, the assignment I'm showing here in Canvas, but it's actually going to be accessed at Netacad, and it's going to be called the chapter five packet tracer skills assessment PT. Okay. So this one is going to go through some of the information on SNMP span, uh, ACLs, but this is also going to serve as your, let me just pull this back up, as your midterm, okay? So when we look at our assignments here, this is going to be assignment for, where is it? Right here. So this is that skills integration challenge. So under this assignment, in LCCC Canvas. I did also post a video walkthrough of this because I realized some of the information is new and uh, we don't have the benefit of doing the hands-on labs on this section. There's also no packet tracers uh, that cover each topic. So these are gonna be all combined in this one skills integration channel. So feel free to use resources. Uh, you can look at parts of this video walkthrough, you know, whatever you need to do. But this will be uh, your midterm grade for the actual course, okay? Uh, until we hit the next chapter, uh, I'm going to end it here then. And we will be back next with, I believe we're going to be looking at quality of service next. So I'll see you next time. Stay healthy, stay safe.